Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. So we are about to start our first session for the morning. And this will be the AFI Research Initiative, which aims to gather evidence on the relationship between monetary stability, financial stability, and financial inclusion in emerging and developing economies. This session will be moderated by AFI Executive Director, Dr. Alfred Hanning. Please give him a big hand. We have selected a very appropriate panel for you this morning. And uh, you will see them over here in the screen. But uh, let me call them in one by one. Let's start with Deputy Governor Soraya hakuzi -Adamye. She is from the National Bank of Rwanda. Also joining the panel is Professor Dirk Andreas Zetsche. ADA Chair in Financial Law and Exclusive Finance at the University of Luxembourg. Let's give him a big hand, please. Yeah, good morning uh, once again. And well, what to start with? I think uh, there's no connection, by the way. Um, but I, I mean, with the previous session, but of course, I would like to congratulate for winning the Nestle SME Financial Inclusion Innovation Award again, Soraya, which is um, great that uh, we found um, such, a, such a great uh, winner for this. Award. Now, um, as you remember, uh, yesterday's discussion, um, the, the, actually the first bigger panel that we had around uh, financial inclusion in the era um, of um, global uh, uncertainty, I think we, we had, a, again, I think a wonderful and very insightful exchange among uh, the four panelists um, regarding um, the so-called trade-off. Yeah? And I think what was intended from this discussion, and I think we came quite a long way uh, during the 90 minutes, is actually not only to once again emphasize the various complementarities among these different objectives, but also, of course, um, finally getting a really systematic, analytical, um, and sound narrative around this relationship. And um, you may wonder, uh, because um, some of you may think, okay, we have discussed this for quite some time, and we as central bankers, we always know that uh, there is tension between these objectives. Um, and we have also heard that in the global south, perhaps in some of the emerging and advanced economies, there is obviously a m quite an advanced understanding on these complementarities and also the intention to avoid that we lose the gains of financial inclusion that we all have achieved in the past years. Now, this is um, going on very long, but now it's still very relevant. And I think not only yesterday's discussion demonstrated the relevance, um, I mean, I can really talk from my own experience, and I wanted to uh, particularly mention two um, um, events uh, where I came across uh, this issue again. Um, you know, I participated in the BCAO 60th anniversary, end of last year in Dhaka, and I was very impressed. Uh, first of all, the BCAO did a great job in organizing this meeting with many governors from Africa, but also um, top um, financial regulators from ad advanced economies and multilateral organizations. But, you know, the way the session was organized was for me very impressive because there were three pillars. There was one big um, stream on monetary stability, one big stream on financial stability, and one big stream on financial inclusion. And um, I was actually very um, enthusiastic when I saw that because uh, there seemed to be a kind of 
equal, equal uh, priority on these three. And that was very encouraging. And the discussions, uh, in fact, showed that this complementarity is by far, is by far uh, not shared by everyone, yeah? especially not from those ones who are perhaps not uh, working that closely with the AFI network. Now, um, I then had side conversations, and um, I may want to reveal that I had a very good talk uh, with uh, Deputy Governor Soraya from the National Bank of Rwanda, and uh, she pulled me to the side, if I may share, Soraya, and you said, look, Alfred, um, we are under an enormous pressure at the moment, and I'm sure she's echoing what many of you feel at the moment. Um, we want to actually preserve these gains of financial inclusion, and uh, we do see a risk that financial inclusion um, can be crowded out from our policy agenda. And I said, okay, I hear you, and uh, what can we do? Maybe we need to do something. And uh, we actually walked away with a kind of light understanding that we would speak again. Yeah? And, and um, in the meantime, you know, we went back, we, we, we reflected at home, and um, at some point um, I actually thought, and I also met with Dirk, I think we met uh, for over dinner and talked a little bit about these issues, and um, it dawned upon me that um, although the relevance of this complementarity among the three objectives is used by all of us in order actually to back up our work, we actually lack the databases for it. Yeah? We do not have the kind of very analytical databases that would finally help us also to strengthen this narrative more systematically in, in effect, and yesterday it came up in the panel, I think to also to, to reinforce some of the messages from the regulators from the Global South. So um, having said this, you know, we, we in fact uh, moved forward and um, conceptualized um, a note um, that I then, I mean, I, I, I put something together and we in fact, you know, talked to some of you and the react and it was really a random uh, kind of selection, you know. Um, I was aware of a few countries that are very, very interested in these issues, and I was also thinking of a regional um, balance. Um, so basically, um, we had conversations with uh, five of the regulators, and all of them were very enthusiastic and thought, yeah, that's a good idea to strengthen the database, but we don't have this data, but we can produce it. So um, I think it was quite fast, and we wanted to be on time for the Global Policy Forum. Um, and we um, got the agreement with five of you uh, to participate in a research initiative. Yeah. And uh, these five members are the Banco Central del Paraguay, um, the West African Central Bank, the BCAO, the Palestine Monetary Authority, the National Bank of Rwanda, who is represented here, and finally also the National Bank of uh, Cambodia. So these five countries agreed um, uh, to collaborate under a research initiative. And I continued the conversation with Dirk Cheche, the professor who is sitting here from the University of Luxembourg, and he got even more excited. And well, you will hear today from him as well how we can approach this in a way that it is useful for all of us. So this is the background. The background um, uh, is also yesterday's discussion. And I actually would now like to dive directly into um, this short conversation and ask uh, uh, DG um, uh, the first question, which is um, around um, the point that financial inclusion has, and we have seen that now, increased dramatically uh, in your country, but have you observed any broader impacts on the economy or other goals of the central bank, such as monetary and financial stability? So it's actually the question. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Alfred, and um, it, it's a pleasure and an honor to be here. Um, and it's true um, to see that um, from a conversation that started at the BCAO 60th anniversary in Dakar in November, uh, here we are with, with um, you know, looking at this research that will look at 
um, the complementarity between monetary stability, financial stability, and financial inclusion, especially at a time where, because of um, you know these high inflationary pressures, geopolitical tensions, you know, financial inclusion can can sort of fall um, uh, from from the list of priorities of, of central bankers. Um, and coming back to your question on on what we can say um, in the case of Rwanda, uh, whether financial inclusion has had an impact uh, on the broader economy uh, in the past uh, uh, few years or 15 years or so. Maybe I'll start with, with a few words on, on, on Rwanda's stance on inclusive policies in, in social economic development of our country. Um, so the past 29 years as we were rebuilding uh, our country from uh, the genocide against the Tutsi in 1994, inclusion has been at the heart and the center of uh, all our policies, starting with gender parity, being in the political space, but also giving equal opportunities in education, health um, to, to girls and boys um, in, in Rwanda and men and women. Our constitution has enshrined a minimum of 30% of female representation at all levels uh, of leadership in our country. And we can see that really, although it has taken close to 30 years um, in the political space, um, female representation or women representation is at its highest where in parliament we have more women than men, 63% of our uh, MPs are women. In cabinet now, uh, we also have slightly more women, 52%. And this has been a deliberate effort to include um, all segments of our population in leadership. We don't see a similar um, progress yet in private sector. Um, and we still have um, financial inclusion gap in terms of, um, you know, uh, gender gap, but also when we look at uh, how many youth are included versus uh, people above 30, per, uh, um, 30 years old. But uh, incidentally, when we look at the progress in financial inclusion, there are two key points that I could mention. One, it's true that in 2008, only 48% of Rwandans had uh, some sort of bank account or at least uh, members of saving groups. Uh, by 2020, that number had risen to 93%, including informal saving groups, and generally driven, as we mentioned uh, yesterday, by mobile money accounts. When we look at the formal uh, um, financial inclusion, we are still at 77%. The gender gap is at uh, between 7 and 8%, so slightly higher than the average in Africa, and we're trying really to address that by a new uh, financial inclusion uh, roadmap, which we hope that um, um, all the government stakeholders will adopt and we can start implementing it with a target to uh, reduce the gender gap um, to 0% overall uh, in the next five years and reach 95% of uh, um, banked uh, population in, in the same span. And that um, increase in financial inclusion has coincided by a drastic reduction uh, in poverty levels, where um, the Rwandan population living um, in extreme poverty was at 45% um, uh, uh, in 2010. And in less than a decade, we managed to reduce it to 38%, meaning more than a million people that were um, were um, out of poverty in less than a decade. So that has been very, uh, a very positive development. Second um, aspect was the creation of saving um, and credit cooperatives uh, in the rural areas, mainly to make sure that uh, the population can have access to banking services and micro ser um, finance services at every sector level and sector generally is sort of a subunit of districts. We currently have more than 416 uh, saving and credit cooperatives where members are um, uh, the, the, the people in, in every sector um, in Rwanda, uh, currently covering three million people. And that has, one, increased the level of deposits um, in, in, in microfinance. 
and second also diversify the concentration that we would see in deposits in the banking sector. And that spurred also credits to, let's say, farmers, um, uh, allowing them to, to grow their activities, um, small businesses in, in the rural areas mainly. So it was also a source of, of job uh, opportunities. Um, and lastly, um, talking about digital financial services, uh, mobile money was introduced around 2008, 2009. We currently have um, um, six million active um, uh, subscribers to mobile money, and that's about 79% uh, of our adult population. And this has really, um, one, allowed us to have more formal uh, sources of, of, um, of, of um, savings. There are also products with the partnership between commercial banks and mobile network operators uh, to, to give micro loans uh, to our population. And when we look at even currency in circulation, uh, the high level um, of currency circulation out of the banking system we used to have before mobile money uh, represented 57% of base money. So direct impact on, on monetary policy itself. And today that ratio has dropped 10 uh, percentage point. While the, 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 the volume of digital transactions represented less than 1% in 2011, 0.3% of GDP. And today we're at 112% of GDP. So there's clear correlation between financial inclusion um, impact on monetary policy, um, in spite of some limitation on monetary policy transmission mechanism, but also being able to sort of build a more um, a digital economy and capture savings from, you know, that were cash-based uh, from in sev informal saving groups into the formal uh, banking and microfinance sector. And also one of the projects that uh, actually the National Bank of Rwanda put forward for this uh, uh, financial Inclusion Innovation Award was the digitization of saving groups, where we're trying to see how we go in villages, working with several uh, not-for-profit organizations that work with, with savings and, and credit associations to really digitize um, uh, their, their uh, savings and then bring them into the formal sector. So there's a lot of initiatives that have, have gone into that, and we can see that Promoting financial inclusion has had a direct impact on alleviation of poverty, which is really the bigger purpose, but also formalization of some of these saving groups. Thank you. Yeah, <coughs> thank you for this first um, um, impression on, on, on the Rwanda situation, but a uh, quick follow-up question is, is around um, the specifics um, uh, of, of uh, what you actually mentioned to me earlier regarding these risks to your financial inclusion goals that arise from the okay. elevated risks we are now seeing to price and financial stability mm -hmm. and um, the global response actually. So can you be a bit specific for the run case? Mm -hmm. How does it look in practice? Um, so uh, as we mentioned earlier, as um, I, I think we, we are really looking forward to new numbers of financial inclusion after COVID-19. Uh, the last survey we did, which was a, a demand um, uh, uh, side survey in 2020, which gave us uh, that 93% financial inclusion, including informal um, uh, financial services, uh, that was in 2020. So now we're trying to capture what has happened since then, and we'll have a new, um, uh, a new FinScope survey, which we do with uh, Access to Finance Rwanda, an NGO uh, partly financed by, by the UK F FSDO, um, and, and one thing that we are concerned about is the um, effect of the uh, cost of living crisis on financial inclusion. Uh, people have been um, obliged to draw down on their savings uh, to be able to cope, one, with the COVID-19 pandemic impact, and secondly, um, you know, the, the very high inflation that we've had in Rwanda um, last year our inflation peak was around 21%, which was the highest we've ever had. Now we're back to um, uh, 11 percent. It's still very high. Our band normally should be between two and eight percent. 
Uh, and secondly, um, uh, the effect of, of um, increase of prices. Uh, we recently did an assessment with the World Bank to look at the impact of uh, inflation on the levels of poverty. Although the assessment and, and, and uh, deeper study is being conducted, the first um, result that came out of that was that if we have um, an inflation of 30% and above, we are at risk of having 6% of our population going back into poverty. And we've had, in terms of food inflation, in some months uh, last year, um, you know, on fresh food inflation, 40%. So that shows that there's a direct impact between inflation, poverty levels, and hence financial inclusion as well. So that's one thing, and I really look forward to this, this study to look at really evidence on how inflation or price um, variations um, impact on, on financial inclusion as well as financial stability, where we have you know, rising levels of non-performing loans, what does that mean uh, for financial stability? Uh, on the policy response, um, we've been, as central bank, because of this high inflation that we've had since February 2022, we also tightened our monetary policy, increasing our policy rate by 300 basis points from 4.5% we had uh, during the COVID time to now 7.5%. And that, of course, has a direct impact on the cost of funding for banks um, and also uh, the cost of funding um, of credit. Um, and this has an impact, of course, on, on households, but also on, on the small businesses uh, that, one, struggle to get access to the funding, but now when they get it, it's also um, a little bit uh, costly. Um, and that, uh, you know, has an impact on their investments, on growth. But as a central bank, our first mandate being price stability, we don't have any other choice than really reducing uh, inflation using tighter monetary policy. Although we know for a developing country, it has a cost on growth, but also a cost on access to finance um, for, for household and SMEs. So I think as we continue to see these uh, protracted inflationary pressures, that will also constrain the people's ability to save, uh, to access uh, loans. And on the other hand, inflation is really costing on the purchasing power. And the last bit of it is, as the Fed has hiked its interest rates and the US dollars has strengthened, that has also an impact on um, uh, national currency, the run and franc, as in many uh, developing countries. So all those factors are really, um, you know, having a big impact on, on financial inclusion, uh, but also the purchasing power and, and, and the saving ability of our population. Well, well thank you so much for, for this picture. Now, uh, Professor Dirk, uh, I mean, I saw that you got very excited when we discussed this first, and I'm, I have seen and not, noted that you already connect with your team from the University of Luxembourg uh, with the research teams from uh, the five member institutions. So there seems to be already um, some work underway. But before I ask you my second question on, on the methodology and the approach as such, I just wanted to know for you as a, as a researcher and, uh, and, and the chair uh, uh, of that fa uh, faculty at the University of Luxembourg, what is your motivation, really? Um, a, a lot has been said about this or not. Or why do you want to work on this? <laughs> That's a personal okay. question. Uh, and it goes a bit back into my vita, because when I accepted the other chair um, uh, that deals with the regulation of uh, financial inclusion in 2015, um, I was convinced that this is the way how we can achieve sustainable development. And I was working now for almost 10 years with a lot of AFI members on many missions on digital financial inclusion, on inclusive green finance, on many tools how to get there. And I was always thinking that this is universal belief. But when you find more, let's say, conservative finance experts, they will put financial inclusion uh, closely to high default rates, high transaction costs, low capital market efficiency. So these are the terms that come. And um, I 
looked then into the research and I found a couple over 30 publications, but none of them in the top 10 journals. And within the finance uh, circles, we have to know that something that isn't published in the top 10 journals is not existing. Yeah? It's not the truth, it's just a myth. And so in a way we can say financial inclusion is a myth, at least from the perspective of these conservative finance circles. And I found this is a challenge. Um, I'm, I'm a lawyer, I have some training in finance as well, but I always thought that the truth is what happens in the real world and not what's published in journals. And so in a way, I try now to reconcile the truth in the real world with what is happening there, because I think it makes a case for many AFI members uh, much easier when it comes to justifying why they spend money on certain things. We all know that in uh, times of poly crisis, there's always a need to become more efficient, to restructure. And then the question comes up, what do I retain under situation of stress and what will I cut? That's um, the reality and we are facing this reality for at least four years now. And I'm, I'm thinking there it's crucial to have a solid pillar um, that justifies that we retain financial inclusion policies. And it is basically an outward argument, but also an inward argument uh, that we actually know what is good for the economy, what is really the outcome be beyond um, what we as agents believe within our agency bubble yeah, in which we are. So in this regard, um, I found from the outside six arguments extremely important when it comes to financial inclusion. I think the one argument that doesn't need any further discussion right now is financial inclusion as crisis management tool. Of course, in 2019, you couldn't explain this to anyone, but today we all know that uh, G2P payments, support payments can't work when you don't have a fully digitized economy. The other thing that um, I found increasingly important is um, that financial inclusion is the key enabler to long-termism. Um, I teach this in the classroom, very simple. When you lose the money that you are to save, then you will just spend it rather than investing it into a long-term use. And uh, so th this enabling of long-termism, of, of good investments rather than investments at hand, I think is becoming very crucial when we're thinking about sustainability, about uh, uh, basically keeping the planet as a place to live for humankind. Then the third element, and that's a bit awkward, but I think it's important, um, if we have a large sector that is informal, we will not be able to charge taxes. And for an advanced economy, we need to be able to refinance the state. Uh, and in this regard, charging taxes relies on formalism of economic transactions, and in this regard, um, financial stability is definitely also related uh, to have a, having a greater degree of financial inclusion. Um, yesterday, um, it was mentioned that we can use the financial system as transmission vehicle for a good monetary policy. Yeah? So um, this is also now, Excellency, um, stressed by you that uh, the uh, connection between inflation and financial inclusion shall be explored more deeply. This is one aspect of the research that we're pursuing. I cannot promise you yet results and probably we will need to think here in base kits um, simply because we have some very much included uh, uh, societies with very high inflation. I can just lay me in, mention England. Yeah? And we have other societies with not so advanced financial inclusion figures, uh, but low inflation. So we need to think here about um, alternative causation and um, we will do this. And this is definitely one pillar that I take from this AFI conference to look at. Let me now finish up with my other two arguments. Um, I'm convinced that financial inclusion enhances regulatory effectiveness, simply because if we have a greater degree of economic actors under the direct supervision or the indirect supervision by way of in including them in the financial system, these data will also be integrated in the decision making of the regulators and that shall lead to more robust um, uh, overall economic conditions. And the final point, I think, comes from digitization of finance. Um, they shall lead to lower transaction costs if we regulate them correctly. Yeah, let's say it that way, because we can offset any positive effect with <laughs> inadequate regulation, and I think proportionality is a key term here in this regard. But if we have lower transaction costs per client, we should 
from a theoretical perspective, have greater market efficiency, greater competitiveness, and greater refinancing opportunities, simply because the amount of deposits or the amount of money in mobile money accounts will be retained in the financial system, and in turn, we have more money on the balance sheets and overall a greater internal financing strength. Well, thanks very much for, for sharing with us these, I mean, as it is research, uh, I would think, I would say initial, yeah. six dimensions. Uh, we have been looking at, I think at the beginning we discussed two. Uh, now we are already at six, so this is going to be super interesting, but one thing is obviously clear, um, the objective um, uh, ultimately is of course also to make, I mean, I'm using this image of on the, on being positioned in one of the 10, you know, top 10 uh, journals here. Let me translate this really into making a major contribution uh, to this academic discussion, which I think would really help to strengthen the, the narrative um, for, you know, many of our members, which was originally, I think, also uh, the starting point of our discussion um, uh, with the National Bank of Rwanda. But now, just uh, to share with uh, DG Soraya, but also with uh, the members here, um, can you perhaps um, enlighten us a little bit on your methodological uh, approach, the way forward? I do understand that uh, we have a literature review, then you will be a, a testing, and then a full rolling out, which means obviously that if there is uh, really something in it, we could also expand it to more countries than just the five. We could make it maybe broader database for Hafi, things like that. I think all of these are great ideas, but it depends, of course, on what kind of approach you are now uh, taking forward, Dirk. Yeah, we, we try to frame it as an event study because we know um, that we have great advancement in financial inclusion, and so um, the, it's very difficult to compare across countries because simply the economic conditions of the countries are different, but the approach we're taking right now is to take the stage prior to enhance financial inclusion and later. So right now, due to the pandemic, we're in the very interesting position to have very high advancement figures. Yeah, we saw these from the Philippines from about 20% to 60% in just three years. Of course, we know it came due to the crisis, but this allows now us um, to take a kind of um, low level and a high level stage and engage in intra-country comparison if uh, the data set is sound and consistent within a given country. And uh, so this is our initial approach. And later, when we have consistent databases over several countries, then we may also enter into inter-country comparisons. Yeah? But right now, we are staying in intra-country comparisons. And um, we have there um, basically three milestones. Um, starting with the literature review, we looked at which, um, which uh, figures to look at. Then uh, this is basically almost completed. We are right now in the beginning of the pilot phase. In the pilot phase, and thank you very much also for the support of um, the Central Bank of Rwanda, um, we started to talk to the research teams inside the central banks and how they determine financial stability and what figures they look at and which data is available and which data may need to be collected. And this is a stage in which we are right now, and I can report a bit on the progress uh, maybe later, um, but uh, maybe before I do this, um, we came across, um, of course, uh, some insights. It seems to be that uh, the IMF uh, financial stability indicators seems to be a well-accepted norm and it is reported on a quarterly basis. We heard from many countries that they have some additional figures to look at, but our initial research at least yields the result that these additional figures are not consistent. So some countries look at different figures than others. Um, this will be very interesting in a, a kind of second stage of the project to look at why countries look at these different figures. Um, right now, um, we try to get one consistent database to, to have one methodology that we can apply. Um, the other element, and I thought it is easier before I started the study, but now I know why there's not so much research, and that is the input data. The input data is what is financial inclusion? And this now draws on probably the most difficult question that I, uh, that I never thought it would ha exist, but when you go and look across countries, um, uh, even among the five countries we have looked so far on, um, we see five different concepts of financial inclusion. And let me just give you one example. Um, some include my mobile money operators, some include remittance services, some include um, money exchanges, some include 
or exclude credit unions, um, microfinance institutions, and so on. And of course, I knew from my regulatory study that all of these different exist, but also it's very interesting that this goes to the heart of AFI, that we don't have a common definition of financial inclusion. Uh, we all know, to a certain extent, um, that it matters, but this was some groundwork, and, and thanks also to the AFI management unit, because we went through the AFI releases of the last years, and um, uh, there is this release from 2015, 2016, what financial inclusion involves, but there's some discretion in it. And now, uh, basically, uh, we, we have to do this work and find a common agreement, and our preliminary um, uh, thesis is that the best way is to look at payments account. So whatever service results in a payment account would then be counted as financial inclusion. So we don't look at credit, we don't look at savings, um, because um, payment seems to be the basis of everything. Um, and much of the theory that I, um, I recapitulated uh, would rely on payments rather than savings or credit. And so this is um, the kind of three-step uh, approach. Once we have bypassed the pilot phase and we know that our model is robust and that we know what input data we generate, we will be very happy to roll out it to every AFI member that is willing to participate. And um, this is at least, um, if we really want to have a very sound argument, then it won't relate to two or three or five or ten countries. But basically, if we have a very robust study at the very end, we could say most of the AFI members support the study. That would be, of course, a dream for a researcher, but I think also good for the cause of financial inclusion. Well, thank you. I mean, this, is, this will be an ongoing discussion. I think we are going to carry this forward um, over the next couple of years. And, and um, I'm, I'm really looking forward uh, uh, to this collaboration. But Dirk, uh, maybe in a nutshell, uh, you have done the pr uh, preliminary literature review. Can you maybe give us uh, three or four highlights uh, from what you have found? Uh, what is out there already that you can share very briefly? As I said, the problem is very often um, that the database is not robust, so what I'm recapitulating now is more a kind of thesis aired rather than evidence. But I think some result that did not surprise us is the negative effect of de-risking on financial inclusion. I think everyone who comes from the inside knows that this is happening, and so it wasn't surprised that the literature view is quite uniform. Um, when it comes to the impact on market efficiency due to enhanced digitalization, um, there is just a very small number, just three articles or papers dealing with that, um, most of them working papers. That means they haven't been subjected to peer review. That's a difficult thing because we don't know what the data are taken from and we don't know uh, whether they are good. But um, at least three of these um, statements uh, found a positive impact on market efficiency according to the theory because lower transaction costs should not translate in greater efficiency. That is very much a mainstream. So I don't think that this is uh, so surprising. Impact on financial stability, and this is quite interesting. Here, um, the view is split. There are around uh, 31 publications, and um, let's say the ones in the better journals were more critical. Uh, so for instance, they said enhancement of credit um, to financially excluded um, increases default risks and uh, lets put, uh, puts risks on financial stability. Or we also found um, that an increase in non-performing assets. Uh, um, my view is that the one does not necessitate the other. Yeah, we all know that there are bad risks out there, and we don't want the financial institutions uh, to basically subsidize um, bad clients. On the other hand, um, I spoke to quite a number of regulators, and I also, now from my own research, that usually excluded clients are very loyal clients because they have nothing to swap. They cannot go somewhere else. They stay within the institution, and so they kind of depend on the good relationship that they have to be there. And um, one side aspect that will be examined as part of the research is whether there is, in fact, a higher re default rate of the poor people. Of course, when there's a disaster and a crisis, they are more vulnerable because they don't have the reserves. But in the absence of these disaster events, um, maybe I, I 
I, right now, my, my gut feeling, not based on data, is that there is not uh, a reason to say that there are bad risks in that sense. And if it's only disaster related, we can think of disaster report, maybe disaster insurance. So there are ways to deal with these event specific risks. So um, I'm, I'm thinking we draw a lot of lessons on how to shape good policies um, if this data is sound that, that we see right now. Um, I have now taken the critical view because I'm an enthusiast when it comes to financial inclusion and I'm, I'm thinking it's interesting to think about this um, uh, aspect also because um, one of the criticism against financial inclusion that it would cause the risk of high inflation. Yeah, so exactly the opposite of what was discussed here. But that's the point of economic papers. You have 31. Some of them support something. The other have the counter argument. But so in many aspects, for every argument we make in favor, there's some statement also in the literature against it. And that is, of course, something where we can contribute with a very robust data set and basically say with the most comprehensive data set that we have in the world, uh, we may be able to, to shape the, the discussion uh, based on a solid quantitative assessment. Well, fantastic. I mean, this is the, the intention, but of course now, you know, Soraya, when I uh, go back to our initial discussion, maybe you share, what is your motivation now to participate here? And what do you hope, what do you hope to achieve from this project? Uh, I'm, I'm very excited already by the, the initial uh, sort of assessment that Professor Dirk um, has just shared. Um, and, and, and we're glad that the National Bank of Rwanda is, is among the pilot countries. But, but the good thing is I think we have to commend AFI on is having you know, five banks that are participating from different continents to allow also that, that um, uh, comparison. And, and uh, as I was listening on already um, the difference in defining what is financial inclusion and who's financially in included will be very beneficial for, for all AFI members, I believe. So our motivation really as a as, um, central bank, but also an integrated regulator, the National Bank of Rwanda is the supervisor of, of the banking microfinance sector, but also insurance and pension, um, was, was to make sure that we can uh, understand uh, with evidence um, quantifiable um, uh, aspects and, 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 and evidence on uh, the complementarity of our objectives as a monetary authority uh, with a mandate of um, ensuring price stability as it's also a prudential uh, authority on, on with financial uh, stability mandate, but also uh, having in our mandate um, and at a key priority financial inclusion and also financial services consumer protection. So how do we make sure that we can balance uh, these three objectives, um, which is easier in normal times, but as we know in this uh, polycrisis world, it's becoming um, very, very difficult. So that's, that's one of our motivations to really join uh, th this research initiative. The second, we hope that this research um, on the complementarity of monetary financial stability and, uh, and financial inclusion can shed a light on, on the key consideration um, of, of policy strategies uh, that optimally balance our three objectives as a central bank uh, in times of crisis. Second, because we know, um, you know, one of the biggest risks to, to monetary policy and financial stability, not only today, but probably in the next two decades, uh, if there's no radical change, is climate change. So the fact that climate change has an impact on, 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 on um, you know, being monetary policy, but also financial stability. In our own case, um, in May, we had floods in, in uh, the, the, the northern and western part of, of Rwanda in May. Um, with, with losses of lives and, and although the uh, effect on financial stability is not yet uh, clear because we know there's a, a lag in terms of uh, people who have lost their properties, um, not being able to service their loans, we, we're wondering how to really approach uh, the impact um, of such extreme weather events on, on financial stability going forward. But we know also uh, when people lose, um, you know, unfortunately lives, but also their properties, crops, um, they no longer save or they no longer have, um, you know, that they are, they are collateral for this. And so that will have an impact on financial inclusion. So I think already when we see the complementarity on these three objectives, it also allows us to see the risks on one of the uh, 
uh, on the mandate uh, and how that 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 will will touch on on on, on the on, on the other uh, objective. Uh, and lastly, I think as central banks uh, in, in emerging economies and, and developing economies, if we are not careful and really go, I think, follow what, what uh, central banks in advanced economies are putting as their own priority, price stability and that's it. Um, then then we, we will uh, sort of have, will have failed our own population because yes, we're central bankers, but financial inclusion is part of our role in the um, economic development of our own country. So it's up to us to really push for these kinds of research to be able to always bring financial inclusion as a key priority of central bankers and financial regulators. So we're hoping that we can rely on the findings of this research to be more vocal about that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, um, we, we have a, a few minutes left, so if there is any initial reaction or comment from the floor, please feel free. I have one, and I maybe take a second one um, over here and over there. So we have two, and that should be then it in in the interest of time. Can you identify yourself? I'm Stephen Ama, um, Bank of Ghana. Yes, please. Yeah, Prof, I think I really enjoy your discussions and uh, just want your thoughts on these. I think in your discussion, you made it clear the linkage between the financial stability and then the financial inclusion, and you brought to the fore the difficulty to compare countries in respect of the financial stability indicators. And I do agree with you. And so when it to suggest that, is it possible, or probably you want your thought on, um, if you pick the financial stability indicators, I do agree, country by country, the ratios are different. In fact, you may have the same ratio, but what goes into it, the measurement is different. Now, do you suggest that then the study must focus on blocks or regions that have harmonized these ratios or probably the stability indicators ratios and then you can now then look at the linkage to financial stability financial inclusion that probably will bring clarity and for uh, like of course also focus on the comparison and just for us to see the strong linkage between financial stability and financial inclusion just your thoughts thank you thank you very much the gentleman here yeah please sorry good yes, morning yeah. oh Yes. <laughs> My name is Timita Kwayakifari from the Central okay, Bank hi. of Nigeria. Um, it's taking the first part of the question I wanted to ask, so I'll just go to the second one. Um, from the preliminary findings, um, it was interesting to see the differences across countries. So I was wondering if, from what you found so far, or this is intended, that we can actually, down the line, determine the linkages between monetary policy rates and inflation rates across countries and how financial inclusion has impacted on that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nimrub. Okay, but I, sorry, I already promised. So, very brief, please, this gentleman. Hello? Yes, oh, please. yes. Uh, actually, my intervention relates to the first speaker uh, in response to your uh, uh, research ideas, and because I was not really very clear as to what the research proposal was. and. Uh, I, I heard you say, the professor that is, uh, somewhere in your intervention you made reference to the fact that financial inclusion could actually result in effective regulatory uh, okay. something. And I, I thought maybe I was looking at the reverse here, yeah. uh, in the sense that effective regulation would lead to financial inclusion. And uh, I really, whether or not across countries or regions you're looking at a common research proposal, and if so, what exactly is it? Thank okay. you. Thank you. Uh, Nick, this gentleman, please. Thank, <laughs> thank you very much, an excellent panel. Uh, my name is Calvin Bahir. I'm an economist at the GSMA. Um, I just wanted to flag, this is actually a, a research topic we looked at a few years ago as well, specifically the impact of mobile money on monetary and financial stability, looking at a number of countries in sub-Saharan Africa. The findings we had, I think, align with the hypothesis you set out, which is that in countries where mobile money has really um, expanded, it's actually enabled a more effective monetary policy by bringing in more currency and assets to the formal financial system. 
and we didn't find any impact in terms of um, financial stability. So I certainly take the professor's point around um, data, which is something we had to manage, but we're happy to share the results of that study as well if it's going to be Fantastic. something that's useful for this. Fantastic. Thank you for the offer. I think we conclude uh, with a final statement uh, from Professor Dirk, and then we move on. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Comparing cross countries is something that I don't dare in an early stage of the project. It's too complex, too many alternative causations. So I'm thinking um, within countries is the first layer. When we have consistent data, um, we may move to the second one. Just to give you an idea, we have inconsistencies as to double counting of accounts by the same individuals. Some countries can erase it, some others don't. Um, uh, Rwanda, by the way, is very advanced because there's an ID-based screening. Other countries um, have just numbers um, which are not screenable. Language culture, we have thousands of influences which I don't know um, how we can credibly erase in a cross comparison. Maybe later, um, when we have a consistent database, as to um, effectiveness and regulation. So um, this is mutual beneficial. Let me just take the example of small clients. When we initially had to deal with small clients, the regulatory costs per client were excessive and we excluded them. Now that we include them, we learn how to best deal with them. Just let me take the idea of proportional AML KYC. Yeah? Uh, so there is a kind of mutual beneficial effect. Um, you include them, you learn, you adjust, and you have a broader scope of your regulatory radar. Let me take the uh, example of inclusive green finance. We will learn a lot about the sustainability impact of these clients simply by including them in the system and getting more advanced data on their externality. So there is always a mutual effect between inclusion and regulatory effectiveness, and I'm, I'm thinking the AFI network is the best example for that. Thank you. Well, thank you for that. <coughs> um, thank you very much, uh, Professor and University of Luxembourg, to come in and uh, support us with this and take lead on the on the on the data collection and the research. Uh, DG Saraya from National Bank of Rwanda, thank you very much for coming. Thank you also for the encouragement in doing this. And what I obviously can promise is that we will at the next uh, Global Policy Forum um, that uh, we will have um, uh, to be revealed later, where we go, we will have an update. Yeah? We will have an update on this and hopefully uh, the first robust results. By then we will not have made it into the top 10, I guess, but I think we will at least add to the discussion and strengthen the narrative on something that is very, very close to our heart. Thank you very much and please. Thank you very much, Dr. Hannigan. We look forward to that update in the next GPF. Thank you also, Professor Dirk and DG Soraya.